So with my latest short film, Where Is My Dog Pico, I knew that I wanted to try out some animation uh, tricks and uh, techniques that I hadn't really done before. And so yeah, with this video, I wanted to take you through those different jumps into the unknown, specifically my homemade, cheap as hell, multi-plane camera apparatus. Without further ado, let's get into the ah. So if you're not in the know, you might have been asking in that first segment, huh, what is a multi-plane camera? Well, this is kind of the multiplane was something that was invented way back in the 30s or 40s, whatever, as a thing to make animated films more realistic by instead of having just the character on a flat sheet of transparent paper in the background, you have multiple layers of glass where different elements of the scene can sort of stand upon. So you've got, you know, your backgrounds on the bottom, your foreground stuff on the top, you've got your characters in the middle or somewhere or whatever, and it basically allows you to take a stacking of 2D things and put them in a sort of a weird approximation of like a 3D environment. When uh, I decided that I wanted to make a film using this sort of technique, it was in a slightly different vibe where I wanted to have three dimensional characters and put them on this 2D plane. So all of the glass that I ended up using Oh, it, that one fell. I basically went to Goodwill and got like three or four poster frames and then just basically took out the glass, cleaned it as well as I could. Uh, All together that cost me about 20, 23 bucks or something like that and that was basically the only real expense on this film. For a lot of actual real legit multiplane stuff you would want say like non-reflective or like glass that has like the edges like kind of filed down Oh, so that you don't like make your hands bleed when you're animating and if you accidentally goof yourself on the side of it. I didn't have the money for that, so I just took gaff tape and basically just covered up the edges and bada bing bada boom. Now uh, the next sort of thing you need to do is some way to stack up the different pieces of glass that you have. So my solution was to get different books and stack these uh, books up and put the panes of glass in between them. The weight of the books for a lot of these panes keeps them held down and then for this top one that's just kind of sitting right there, I just made sure to be very, very careful so that I didn't nudge that one little bit. Now using those books to hold up the layers of glass had a lot of advantages and they actually worked pretty well for me but they come with their own limitations. Normally with a lot of the professional multi-plane systems, you would basically have a very fine control over how high and low you could place your panes of glass. A lot of times you would have all these freaking levers and rails and stuff like that so you could really easily raise and lower all of your different panes and basically be sure that you can put it exactly where you want to. But with these, I only had certain heights of books and boxes at my disposal. The one thing that I knew I could uh, use instead, or at least in substitution for that fine control, was the camera itself, or miraculously the camera and all of this goofy stuff that's on there. So I have my Canon T3i mounted up on the top. That weird little cross thing that it's sitting on is basically like a rail slider. It allows me to move it left and right and up and down with a very fine degree of control. It's something that ever since I found out about and actually put on my camera has basically never come off with any of the animations that I've done in the past. Right under it is a geared tripod head which also has all these little knobs that allow me to turn and rotate the camera. It wasn't as useful on this one. For the most part, the camera is to be pointed basically straight down, but still not a bad thing to have, especially if I needed to readjust the camera and get things pointed exactly right before a shot goes off. Right after that is actually this weird little 
tripod that my dad bought at Goodwill when I first started animating. I've never heard of this brand of tripod like since then, but this has been a really freaking nice tripod, specifically for the fact that it has this little knobby turny wheel thing where I can super easily zero in on the exact height that I want to at a very sort of consistent degree of control. And so the total cost for this whole setup was, well, as I said, the cost of the glass, like 20 bucks or something like that. It's very jerry-rigged. It's not the most professional, but for my purposes in this film and for what I wanted to do with it, it really worked really well. The main thing that you sort of find out when you're dealing with all of this glass is that pretty much your whole life becomes trying to minimize or just completely get rid of all of the freaking reflections that glass likes to make. What usually ends up happening is that instead of having lights kind of set up higher and on an angle, you largely wanna to try to have as many of your lights as possible off essentially perpendicular to your sets. So I've got one light off to this side over here that's kind of filling in from the top as well as another little light down here that's punching in to uh, get a little bit more fill on the background. Uh, there's a couple over here doing some similar things. Got this little desk lamp right over here and then another one right here that can kind of pull in and get a little bit of backlight on this character from over here. For as semi-complex this whole setup is, the actual animation process itself is relatively simple. Since you're working with this semi two-dimensional stage right here, most of what you're doing is really just taking your elements and picking them up and sliding them around uh, on the screen. I had some questions as to whether I would like blue tack or secure down the characters on the table. And while I would do that for set elements such as this little table right here, for most of the characters I'm moving them often enough that I don't really want them to be that stuck to the table. I want to have a good degree of control over how well I'm able to move it. So they're basically just kind of sitting free right there and I basically just rely on having a relatively careful hand and a little bit of uh, frame flipping back and forth to make sure that they're moving in a way that I like. But stuff as simple as this I found really kind of pushed me to find different ways of animating a little figure and uh, doing things just like walking or raising their arms or like going into an emotional breakdown or something like that that I wouldn't have found if I was doing something in a regular three-dimensional world. So I really enjoy the way that this kind of thing opens up different possibilities. Where the fun really kind of starts is basically taking all these different layers that you have and trying to place things throughout your little tower right here so as to sort of construct some depth out of the flatness. So you've got several layers to work with here, including all the stuff down on the furthest back plane that's just kind of sitting there on the table. And so where you're placing your objects and characters on the different planes is gonna have an effect on how they look in the shot and sort of what sort of depth or lack thereof you're gonna be getting from that placement. Taking like the sort of shot here where the blue man is kind of falling down into the mud. We have our mud layer up here on the top, followed by Blue Boy right down here, right below, followed by another layer of foliage down here, and then a further layer down here. And all of these in the final shot are able to sort of just kind of coalesce. Even though he's sliding in this weird little two-dimensional fashion, he still feels like he's like in a world. It's where there is a front and a middle and a back. For simpler shots like the one where the blue guy is standing on the hill, I didn't really want detail so much as depth. Literally, this shot is literally just the top layer with the blue man and his hill standing on it, the back layer with the little cottage and its hill, and then two in-between layers of glass. So when blue's moving back, I basically just simulate him running up a hill, and then when he gets to a good point in his arc, I bounce him back a layer, racking the focus. Then when he comes up the far hill, he's hopped down another plane, replaced with his uh, mini-scale 
dude, and then the camera wrecks again. The depth you get here is pretty crude, but it achieved the effect that I was going for. It's how I achieved basically every forward and backward movement in the film, including when the old man goes back to grab the axe, one of my favorite little shots in the movie. So the key here really is to use vertical and lateral movement in conjunction with those plain jumps so that those hops forward and backward don't really feel as jarring. Since they're gonna suddenly decrease in size when they go back a plane, you wanna make that size change feel motivated by the movement of the characters. Using that tried and true animation technique of arcs and spacing. Where basically each move forward and backwards on the multiplane would kind of look like a little hill if you plotted it out in three dimensions and like turned it around. These little purple ticks represent the amount of change in the character's position between frames. Forgot to record that. Oopsie poopsie. The wind up and wind down portions of that hill or jump, you'd have a lot closer spacing and therefore would be still on the beginning and the ending plane of the movement. With the middle having more broad spacing, that would allow those jumps to make a little more sense. Spatially. Admittedly, the jangy animation of a lot of the film kind of works in its favor with a lot of these segments as these weird jumps back don't really have to look all that more graceful than the very ungraceful rest of the film. But I found that this technique actually worked out pretty well with some of the more like traditionally animated sections, like when the rabid dog is jumping up from the background when they're walking through the forest. On a few occasions, I would pretty much just get rid of all of the top glass layers and then just animate straight on the bottom, like at the end where blue guy throws the old man onto the wall in the background. I basically just animated straight on top of the bottom layer and then held up that little smear frame of him just with my hand. I feel like that was more of a product of the <laughs> lack of time that I had as I was running out of time to finish up the film. But I did like a little bit of handheld blur that I was able to get. So, troubleshooting. This system has a lot of advantages. It's really cheap and you can set it up and switch it around really easily. But of course, being as low cost as it is, that's always gonna come with some trade-offs. Reducing reflections is the name of the game here. And with cheap glass like this, it's always gonna be a huge factor, but there's a couple of things that you can do to mitigate that. One of the big things is keeping bright lights and materials away from the vertical axis of view that the camera is viewing this whole multiplane from. It's very easy for those things if they get close to the actual glass like that to start appearing and glaring all freaking over your glass and stuff like that. One of the main rules that I kind of figured out was keeping lights about perpendicular with the actual pane of glass. So if you've got a pane of glass right here and your light is this right here, you wouldn't really want to have it like high kind of up like this. You'd want to try to have it about level with the actual glass pane right there. It achieves, I think, a much more realistic lighting effect since it feels as though the light is kind of coming from like above, in front of, or below, like you would actually scoop light on a set, but it also serves a lot to get rid of glare. Another thing is keeping high contrast materials and stuff like that also away from the set. The thing that really ended up coming up was the Canon logo on my T3i was actually showing up a lot, especially when I had the camera down lower, closer to the glass. So I ended up taping that up with some gaff tape and that pretty much just disappeared. But sometimes you'll still get things like the camera or even the characters themselves 
kind of reflecting in the glass. And part of this is just kind of a thing you have to deal with if you're working with cheap glass. But doing things like keeping the background nice and dense with the detail can make that at least a little bit less distracting since it'll kind of just get lost with all of the stuff that's going on behind your characters. The other thing I would often do is actually widen up my f-stop so it would get down low to like a freaking get down low to like a 5.6 or like a 3.5 or something like that even like a 2.8 on one of my lenses. Um, doing that it's almost basically keeping those reflections out of the field of focus on the camera so really like you almost can't even see the reflections because they're just not in focus. You'd have to decide for yourself if it makes visual cohesive sense for your shot, but I thought it works not only to cover up reflections, but also kind of add a sense of depth to the shot as well. Kind of, you know, blurring out the background a little bit and then getting that foreground of focus and then you kind of rack back and rack. One of the other big downsides is shadows. Having these big old books it's gonna make it so that these lights off to the side are a lot more likely to cast a little bit of shadows on here. Part of it is really just lighting and figuring out where you can fill in those shadows with light. So it's, it's how lighting is, I guess. But there were a few ways I had of dealing with this. Since Lego is itself like a really small thing, a lot of times I was able to lower down the camera enough so that it was focusing on such a small portion of the set that you really wouldn't even be able to see the shady outsides of the frame. But this didn't help me with the wider shots, like the opening or the portions in the house where they're sitting at the table and whatnot. And so this is where, honestly, the size of the frame actually came in. That weird one-to-one -one aspect ratio isn't really an accident. But it allowed me to get these wider fields of view while cutting off the parts of the frame where distracting crap like extraneous objects and shadows and reflections were creeping in. With the added bonus of having almost like two-thirds less of a frame to set design for. Practicality! Now a couple other things about the different techniques that I did in the video with regards to the other big one, the hand-drawn facial animation. I'd done a couple of tests prior to this film. Don't eat things off the ground. Most of it really was just as simple as taking a regular or more accurately fine point expo marker and drawing directly on the face whichever expression or blink or frown or smile or whatever that I wanted on here. It took a bit of uh, trying to find the marker that would work just right. At first I got this like ultra fine expo marker because I was like oh that'd be great to have like really like precise ability to draw whatever I wanted but one of the things that you kind of find is that some markers kind of lose their like potency after a while and they start kind of smearing or just like not drying so this kind of went to the picture and then finding these regular just sort of fine point ones they ended up working out pretty good but I usually kept a set of like four of them on hand because sometimes they would start kind of drying out weird and not really writing correctly so it's something to keep in mind and so yeah I would just like any regular sort of facial animation kind of follow along with the dialogue track figure out which phoneme would go right with it erase the mouth to correspond with that and then draw on the next phoneme that would correspond with the dialogue or just emotion of the scene and bada bing bada boom there you go i sometimes i would find weird little tricks like if you could erase like part of the face you could kind of go from like a ah open mouth to like a mm, or like a e or something like that if that makes any sense it was mainly just all about how i could get the most expressive mouth using this one centimeter surface as you can see in the final video there's lots of smearing that you can kind of see on the final minifigure face so I guess that might bother some people. 
It didn't really bother me. I kind of liked that weird little like messy texture that you get on their faces. It's almost like they got like the weird dry erase like equivalent of like wrinkles and pimples and crap on their face. I think for me at least whatever can give a nice texture feel to the movie the better. The dog in the video is basically this weird little brick built creature with this one solid head, a little detached ear to get some nice bounciness in its movements, and then four replacement body pieces to basically simulate walking and sitting so that I wouldn't have to rebuild it every time it was walking. The designs of those body pieces are based off of the horse that Pongal made for his film Unbridled Mischief. Shout outs to that movie, it really helped me out. I would a lot of times like disconnect the body pieces if I wanted to get a specific animation that them in their pre-made configurations weren't giving to me. But having them like that, I was really surprised and happy with the kind of uh, expressive and goofy animation I was able to get with it. The opening was actually the very first thing that I shot as this film. And having that dog like jump and then bark and then bounce out of frame was like, a big proof for me that this concept might have actually had some legs. <laughs> that first shot doing something new is always just sitting on the precipice of disaster. So <laughs> that was a good pick me up. This movie was super fun to make and it's always cool getting to try out new techniques to get my art and brain out into the world. So I hope that you guys enjoyed watching this as much as I did making it. If you want to see the next one, be sure to subscribe and smack that bell so you get notified right when I plop out a new baby into the world. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye bye now.